Several years ago, my parents' sister and I were leaving the house to go eat or something. We um, were going out the door. My mom walked out into the garage. I was right behind her, and I stopped in my tracks because there was a snake right on the doorstep. I closed the door, my dad went out the front door and walked around to the garage, and somewhere during that I decided why let him have all the fun, I wanted to watch him kill the snake, so I followed him out the front door and around the house, and I arrived at the garage just in time to see the snake slither underneath the closed door into the house. It all worked out okay. We got the snake out of the house and killed it. But this always reminded me of Genesis chapter 4. I guess because snakes have been a symbol of uh, temptation and sin ever since Genesis 3. But in Genesis 4, this is where Cain killed Abel. But God knew this was going to happen, so he warned Cain before he did it. And in verse 7, he he told Cain, sin is crouching at your door, but you must rule over it. That snake right by the door and its ability to slither inside despite the closed door is a powerful reminder that the devil is out there just waiting for the perfect opportunity to get in. This morning we're going to be in Matthew 5. We're continuing our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And the rest of Matthew 5 focuses on some teachings about how to guard against and rule over sin because it is always crouching at the door. And this had been a major concern in first century Judea because they'd been battling sin and corruption in their government and throughout society leading up to the time that Jesus had come. After they had returned from exile, which they'd been dealing with this before, but after they returned from exile, they had a lot of struggles in particular. They were always under the control of some foreign empire. The global political landscape kept changing, and so they were getting passed around from empire to empire, first Persia, then Syria and Egypt, and eventually they got tired of all that and revolted, and they gained their independence for a little while. But it was an unstable situation. So it made it really easy for the Romans to come in and take control, and then they were still in control by the time Jesus came. But those constant power shifts made a lot of the Jewish leaders and elite nervous. They wanted the power themselves. They wanted to make sure that these empires weren't corrupting their beliefs. But in their worry about that, they corrupted themselves. In in effort to gain this power for themselves, they started supporting the empire politically and financially. Sometimes they even betrayed their own people to the empire. They would do favors, expecting favors or support in return. And Jewish politics and theology were so closely intertwined that the priesthood and the temple were also corrupted. And all this corruption trickled down all the way to the bottom. People lived however they wanted to because the leaders were a bad example and didn't care, so there was no one enforcing Jewish law. The whole system was corrupted by sin. So several groups formed in response to this, trying to combat this corruption, and sin in their society. You probably heard of several of them. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots, uh, 
The one you might not have heard of is the Essenes. If that doesn't sound familiar, it's because their strategy to fight corruption was to just completely remove themselves from it. They withdrew from society and lived in this secluded desert community called Qumran where they dedicated themselves to studying the scriptures and even um, making copies of the scriptures. And these are actually the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls while they were there in this community. The Zealots, on the other hand, thought that violence was necessary to stop corruption. They trained for a political revolution, wanting to fight against the empire to free themselves from it. The Sadducees devoted themselves to studying the law of Moses and preserving the Jewish heritage. The Pharisees' approach to me, though, is the most interesting. And it doesn't excuse their behavior in the New Testament, but learning how they came to be and why they formed as a group really helps me to understand why they acted the way they did in the New Testament. They wrote a list of traditions in order to build a fence around the law. They wanted to protect the law. And so their traditions were stricter than the law. So if, if anybody broke the traditions, well, maybe the law will still be safe. Maybe they won't come close to breaking the law. The problem came when they s started seeing their traditions as equal with the law, and they started enforcing them equally. But Jesus had a different approach that he presents in the Sermon on the Mount. He says it's not the law that needs protecting, but our hearts. We don't need to build a fence around the law, but we need to guard our hearts. And this probably sounded heretical to a lot of people in that day, especially to, to those who followed the Pharisees' teachings. And so he started off this section of the Sermon on the Mount with kind of a, a disclaimer to make sure no one misunderstood what he was about to say about the law. And so we see this in verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus came right out and, and said that his purpose is not to abolish the law or even to relax it. And he makes all this clear from the beginning because he, he's about to say some things that might sound like he's nullifying the law. You have heard that it was said, or really, the law says this, but I say to you, it's not even just about this exact wording, but even the way he talked. Just after the sermon ended in Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching as one who had authority and not as their scribes. When the rabbis taught, they wouldn't really use original material. They would always quote somebody else. But Jesus is not quoting other people. He's making his own statements, and these are absolute and final 
statements. And then when he does quote somebody else, he's quoting from the law. He's quoting God. And in a sense, especially to the people who have a different understanding of the law, it seems like he's challenging those quotes. So his teaching presumes authority, much more authority than the people are used to from other rabbis. And so they recognize that at the end of this sermon. And that's why Jesus is making it very clear from the beginning that he's not abolishing the law. Rather, he says that he has come to fulfill the law. Remember last week, we we talked about this backwards world we live in and and how God gave the law to help fix the backwardness and to restore his relationship with humanity. But the law didn't accomplish that. So he sent Jesus to accomplish it instead. But Jesus didn't just come up with a whole new way to do it. He did it by fulfilling the law that was already in place. He paid the price that the law required, which was death, and he invites each of us to symbolically participate in his death through baptism, which also gives us entrance into his kingdom. That's not just a license to live however we want from that point on, though. Jesus fulfilled the penalty of the law through his death so that we can fulfill the law through our lives in him. Now, this isn't done through strict adherence or rigid obedience to the letter of the law. That would be impossible. The New Testament tells us that once we mess up, we would be completely done if we were still under the law. There wouldn't be another chance. But through the sacrifice of Jesus and by the grace of God, the spirit of the law can still be fulfilled in us. Now, just to be clear, we're not obligated to the letter of the law. The New Testament is very clear about that. But we're still expected to live according to God's character and morals. And the law helps to impart those to us. And so the spirit of the law, the idea behind the law, is still valid and important. And that's what Jesus is getting at in his Sermon on the Mount, even while the law was still 100% in place. He's saying, look past the letter, look deeper to the spirit of the law, and apply that. Fulfill that, because that's what's important. It was never about the exact actions and motions that the law required. God has always wanted our hearts, and that's what he's trying to restore. So Jesus fulfilled the letter of the law so that we can live according to the spirit of the law as citizens of his kingdom covered by grace. So in the rest of Matthew 5, Jesus explains this transformation he expects to see. He tells us how the law is to be fulfilled in our hearts and not just our actions. So let's continue reading in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The law says that murder is wrong. 
But Jesus says that it's not just the act of murder that we should avoid, but we should avoid the entire process that could potentially lead to murder. He says that we are just as guilty when we call someone a fool, and just as guilty when we insult someone, and just as guilty when we are angry with a person, even when it's just the emotion and doesn't necessarily lead to action. Even though murder and anger and calling someone a fool or insulting someone are all different actions and they all look different, they are treated equally here because they all stem from the same heart condition. And so if we want to truly guard our hearts like Jesus is talking about, we must avoid the process altogether. We must avoid every precursor to the sin that the law forbids even the emotion that starts the process. As Paul said in Ephesians 4.27, we give the devil an opportunity. We make room for him to come into our lives and give him just enough room to slither in that crack through the door when we hold on to our anger. Sin is crouching at your door, but you must rule over it. So Jesus says that we should work things out with whoever we're angry with or whoever has a problem with us as soon as possible. He said, settle the matter before it goes any further. Settle the matter before it goes to the court. Because you have no idea what will happen and it will just escalate and it get, could get so much worse if you just let it keep going further. But he says we should settle things because it's the right thing to do, not because we're forced to by the courts, not because we're afraid of how far it could get. It's just the right thing to do. And so he says that we should even settle matters before offering our gift at the altar. Even if we're already at the altar with our gift, ready to offer it, we should leave the gift there Go be reconciled and then return to offer the gift. Because after reconciliation, then that gift will be so much more pleasing to God. Now let's skip past verses 27 through 37. Those are kind of related to this, but they're also a separate topic. So we'll circle back around to those next week. But for now, I want to go down to verse 38, which is uh, more closely related to this topic of anger and hatred and murder. And Jesus goes even a step further than he already has. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus is saying that we should try to live out His mission. Maybe I should clarify a statement I made last week, that, that God made all these efforts to... to fix the backwardness and restore his relationship with humanity, but the law didn't accomplish that. And so Jesus came to do that. That is his mission. 
But I, I said that in many ways, when the law didn't fix the backwardness, it even intensified the backwardness. And what I meant by that is actually a part of this passage that we've just read. The law says eye for eye and, and tooth for tooth, meaning that one sinful act will be punished with equal measure. But if somebody gouges a person's eye out and the punishment is to have their own eye gouged out, it doesn't fix anything. It didn't restore the victim's eye. Now, having that in the law may be a powerful deterrent. It may discourage the sin. But when a person sins, the law punishes it and just makes their world even more backwards. And so that's what I meant last week when I said the law intensifies the backwardness, and that's why we need Jesus to actually correct that and restore and fix. That's his mission. And he's telling us that we should live out the same mission as much as possible. Because his kingdom is founded on righteousness and justice. As citizens of his kingdom, we have a responsibility to be righteous and do justice. As we talked about last week, that doesn't mean just doing what's right. And it goes a lot deeper than punishing wrongdoing, which is what we usually think about when we talk about justice. But it also means correcting what's wrong, helping to turn the backwards around. And he applies this principle here in the Sermon on the Mount by saying, don't resist an evil person. Love your enemies. Pray for your persecutors. As Paul said in Romans 12, 21, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil. And he doesn't say overcome evil by responding in kind. Instead, he says overcome evil with good. And in Matthew 5, Jesus tells us what that looks like, how we can apply that in our lives. He says if someone strikes one cheek, don't strike them back. Don't defend yourself but turn the other cheek and let them strike that one too. If someone tries to take your shirt, let him and give him your coat too. If someone forces you to go a mile and it was legal for Roman soldiers to force ordinary citizens to carry their gear for them and it was common for them to abuse that riot. But Jesus says... Don't resist them. Don't argue about it. Don't try to get out of it. But go even further than they force you to. Why? Because we're not doing it just because we're forced, but because of the love and grace of Jesus at work in our lives. Just as he went to the cross for something he didn't do, he calls us to bear our cross and suffer and show the goodness of God in our lives. One of my college professors once read this passage to us and then paraphrased it. He said, be a doormat. People are going to walk all over you, sometimes just because you're a Christian, and you should let them. But even when they do that, your message should still be welcome. Come into God's kingdom. Be a doormat. It's hard to understand and accept and practice the things that Jesus says here, especially when we use my professor's language. It seems backwards. But we have to remember it's because it's actually the world that's backwards. We're trying to reorient ourselves to God's kingdom. 
And sometimes that means letting the backwardness of the world hurt us. You know, we live in a highly individualistic society which promotes and values self. So we think we need to stand up for ourselves and defend ourselves against persecution and resist those who oppose us and vindicate ourselves in front of those who lie about us and insult us. We don't naturally want to do the things that Jesus says. I remember several years ago I was watching a YouTube video where a preacher was offering commentary on some speech that President Obama had made. And this preacher was really riled up because President Obama had quoted some scripture during that speech. And the preacher felt that the scripture had been misused and taken out of context. Well, that scripture was Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the preacher boldly said, but this doesn't mean America's enemies. Now, there may be a time and place for war. That's a complex topic for another time. But even when we support war, we still have to do what Jesus said. We still have to understand that Jesus meant exactly what he said and not what we wanted to say. We can't find some loophole to make it fit our our, our lives so that we can still live however we want. This is how to be a part of His kingdom. We can't just say, this doesn't make sense, so it doesn't apply to me, or it doesn't apply in these circumstances. As citizens of God's kingdom, living in a backwards world, we are expected to engage in the affairs of the world, politics, war, our relationships with others, whatever it may be, using the ethics that Jesus taught. And these passages that we've been reading in Matthew 5 this morning show us what I believe to be the chief value of God's kingdom. Love. As we saw in our scripture reading from Romans 13 this morning, Paul said that love fulfills the law. And he said it again in Galatians 5.14. In Matthew 22, Jesus said that to love God and love your neighbor is the greatest command. For all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If we want the law to be fulfilled in our lives, which is what Jesus said he came to accomplish, we must love because love fulfills the law. This morning, if you need any help in this heart transformation, whether that's through baptism, if you're not already a Christian, or through the prayers of the church, if you are a Christian, come as we stand and sing.